the closing of the day. And I really understand it, but let's let's do it. it it's almost done, my friends. It's almost done. Um, I'm supposed to talk about uh, privacy, but uh, first of all, I'm not a techie guy. I'm not a I'm not uh, into privacy because of my technical skills at all, but mainly because I'm a Bitcoin user. So this is more like a call to action to people that already have the technical skills to know how we are using this kind of uh, tools in developing markets. Because I'm from Venezuela, so who the fuck cares about privacy in developing markets? That's my talk. Who am I? My name is Javier Bastardo. I've been uh, in Bitcoin and crypto uh, since 2017. And uh, I started uh, writing news about Bitcoin in Crypto Noticias, that is a really known uh, outlet. And then I started uh, writing at Cointelegraph. And then I started an educational project that is called Satoshi in Venezuela. And uh, this uh, last two months, I I've been in four Bitcoin conference, like connecting with other Bitcoiners around. Uh, I, I went to Europe and now here in, in, in the continent, in, in Latin America again. So seeing like this kind of uh, thoughts about privacy are shared. Uh, by everybody in the region. Like, this is not something that I'm only thinking by myself. So why developing markets? This is uh, something that I, I find like a little fun because back in the day, in 2017, Venezuela was really a, a hot topic in, in all the crypto outlets and people were saying that uh, we are going to succeed against the Chavismo, against the regime because we are going to use Bitcoin and it was uh, like the like the dream, like having a, a an hyperinflationary uh, context where we can see how Bitcoin could help people. So Bitcoin is supposed to be valuable in in this kind of environment, and also thinking in the same line, like if you are facing an authoritarian regime, you are going to need new ways to exchange values. So that was another of the hot uh, ways to say that we are going to use Bitcoin. And also because uh, of the inflation of our fiat currency, uh, of our local uh, currencies, we are going to better understand the Bitcoin characteristics. I think this this is something that Andreas Antonopoulos said a lot. Like if you are in Argentina or in Venezuela or in Turkey, you are going to understand Bitcoin because, because yes, it's, it's not that good. But And uh, the other thing that uh, it was really hot back in the day saying that uh, around how we are going to use uh, Bitcoin, was this idea of uh, having uh, the option to debase the state through exchanging all your money to Bitcoin. And like the poor people from Venezuela are going to exchange all the, their bolivars or, or something like that. But it, it doesn't work like that either. And at the end, it is uh, because it's good to say that in developing markets, we are going to use Bitcoin because it's a freedom tool and it's really good and it has some privacy elements that could lead you to do your political activities in a more secure way and some kind of things like that. But in, in practice, we are not seeing like those kind of stuff happening. So why do people use Bitcoin and this is in the same in the same way like reading the the most common thesis around why Bitcoin is used in, in developing markets. Like because it is a way to achieve more freedom, because people are trying to flee from their local currency, because they need to move uh, money uh, around the the region. For example, in Venezuela, we have a big, a really big diaspora right now. And people that is living abroad is sending money to the country. And 
for example, in 2017, Bitcoin was really uh, popular to do that, but today it's mainly through Binance and through stablecoins. So, and also, I think this this is one of the main uh, ideas and why people is using Bitcoin in in developing markets. It's because we don't have the chance to earn that much money if you are living through the Argentinian peso, if you are living through the Bolivar or the, I don't know, any currency that you can name in our regions, you are not going to have a really good life if you are earning only that. So this kind of technology, Bitcoin or all the NFT bubble and all the games and all that is mainly see as a way to profit. It's not like uh, a way to achieve more freedom or to uh, be more private or something like that at all. It's just a way to have more money and to buy your food. So, and uh, the like the, le the the key of the demand of this kind of uh, assets is because people is trying to use dollars to avoid their, their local currency. It's not because they are finding privacy or they are looking for any of those kind of stuff that we know that are part of what Bitcoin is, but it's not what we in practice are looking for. We are looking for dollars just to jump out of the Bolivar or the peso. So how do people actually use Bitcoin in, in those markets? Are they using uh, self-custody and are they running their own nodes? Are they using pay join or coin joins or whatever join that you want to build? But actually not. Uh, it's mainly through KYC services, through centralized services like Binance is the the main way that people is using Bitcoin or crypto right now in our markets. Binance is by far the most liquid uh, platform that we have, like people that use uh, USDT or Bitcoin are using it through Binance platform. And it's really common to go to any of the countries of Latin America and be able to exchange your crypto or your Bitcoin, whatever you are you using uh, for the local currency is really liquid in any of our countries. And it's really easy uh, for people to use that because they are trying to avoid the, the local currency, like not to be the most private user of this kind of technology, just to, to avoid the things that are happening in, in our local countries. And also people that is mainly, or, or maybe is more like uh, used to what Bitcoin is or, or already know more in deep, are trying to use uh, out of custody wallets, but it's not that common. Like people use uh, semi-custodial solutions. For example, in El Salvador, you have uh, Bitcoin Beach Wallet, which is uh, the most used wallet in El Sonte for where all the Bitcoin stuff in El Salvador started, but it is a custodial wallet, so it's not like uh, too private or, or whatever. And uh, it's interesting in the mining stuff, for example, in Venezuela, that we have uh, really big uh, mining operations. Uh, I think that they may be kind of private while setting the infrastructure they are using to mine, but at the end, they are cashing out through Binance. So it's the same thing, like you are ultra private with your mind, but you are <laughs> cashing out through the same KYC system. And uh, I think that one thing that I, I, I should say is like Binance is acting like a bank. And I think that is one of the biggest bank in, in Venezuela, in Argentina, in Colombia. And you can say almost the same thing in all the region and in many of the developing markets. So it's a new kind of bank. No, it is, it is not a, a private way to use uh, Bitcoin at all, but it's the way that people that is on bank are going banked. That was a really 
a popular way to uh, say that we are going to use Bitcoin. And there are people that run nodes and are using Lightning, or in including using privacy techniques and all the stuff. But it is, it is a really tiny group. We are uh, in Satoshi in Venezuela is the only Bitcoin only community <laughs> in Venezuela. So it's not that common to have a lot of hardcore Bitcoiners using this kind of technology in Venezuela or in other in other countries. I'm not saying like they're not exist. There are a lot of good friends of mine that are doing this kind of stuff, but it is not the the norm. So who actually cares about privacy? Yes, Christine does. And also this guy. <laughs> These guys do too, too. And probably not you, you that you are reading, but this is the like the <laughs> like the, the the end message, like there are a tiny minority of people that is using uh, that are using these tools that are using this kind of technology in, in a more sovereign way and at the at the end of the day is like this is not the best uh, a scenario that we are having because uh, if people keep using this technology mainly through centralized services they are going to be more open to be like captured and uh, to have the same issues that we are having with the fiat currency and at the end is like doing a circle <laughs> around the fiat problems and ending with a fiat solution even though you are supposedly using bitcoin but if we keep this in mind this uh, <laughs> 13% of uh, Bitcoin users that are really hardcore and that are, are really down to explain why Bitcoin matters and why privacy matters and that are building this kind of space like this conference that is focused in privacy. I think that it could lead us to <laughs> grow this number first and also to see the tools that you are building, because this is a really technical conference, the tools that you are building are going to be used if we can push harder this idea of that Bitcoin is freedom, that Bitcoin could lead you to more freedom through a more private usage, but it, it won't happen just because the tool is out there. Like, it's, it could be in the table, it could be just there and you can even use it in not in a proper way but it's, it, this is just like an invitation to understand that this is a tool that will be really useful in our markets and it's really it's already being used and it's useful by itself but it's not enough to let's say think that because you are building something that will make more easy to use Bitcoin in a private way, the market will choose it by de facto. It's not happening. It's not going to happen that way, I think. And people really don't care to give their data away or to do KYC or whatever, because we are not yet thinking on Bitcoin in terms of how, many, how, how much freedom it could grant. We are thinking on it uh, because we need money, we need to profit somehow. So it's like an invitation to s understand that the market is not that, <laughs> that privacy focused yet, but that we can build it and grow this number then. So that's, that's it, my friends. If you have any questions and if you want to reach me um, on Twitter, CryptoBastardo, a night instead of a Y, and that's it.
No, no, no. It's it's not that mainstream at all. <laughs> it's 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 not that normal to, to let's say it could spend your your USDT or your BTC directly. I think that it is growing and it's taking more stage on the mainstream conversation. And for example, with FTX, you had a lot of bad press because people is linking Bitcoin to this kind of stuff. So, and in the bull market, it went really hard in, into the conversation because the price talks louder than anything. But besides that, I, I don't think that this is yet a part of the mainstream conversation, even in countries where the legislators are already thinking in this, let's say Paraguay. In Paraguay, they are trying to build a law around mining, but in the mainstream media, they are not talking at all about Bitcoin or anything related to Bitcoin because it's not part of what they are looking for. And in Colombia, they have a sandbox for the same thing, for to build a, a law and the regulation around it. And in the media, you see the same thing. And, and in the mainstream conversation, you see that it's not that popular? It's not a popular topic at all? Yes, yes. I, uh, when I started Satoshi in Venezuela, I was a really hardcore believer on the hyper-Bitcoinization that we are going to use Bitcoin to free everybody. Every, every corner of the world will be Bitcoinized somehow. But nowadays, I think that the hyper-Bitcoinization only happens in a personal way. Like, if you decide that it's your money, and by the, the, the nature of Bitcoin itself, you can like impose your view in, in others. Everybody has to choose that Bitcoin is going to be their money. And I think that it's hard to see that the scenario, like people choosing freely to use Bitcoin. So you have, in the other hand, uh, the El Salvador scenario that we can be supporting what is happening in El Salvador, but Salvadorians went to not using Bitcoin to have to have it in their market. They are not forced to use it. Like we are going to El Salvador and we not see anybody jailed because they are not taking Bitcoin at all. But it's something that is imposed to the market and the way that is is not working as expected some way. So if you have the the scenario happening in Venezuela and in Argentina, where it's not going um, a hyper Bitcoinization at all, and you also have the other scenario in El Salvador, where the state is the one that is pushing the the Bitcoinization, and it's not happening in any of those uh, countries or where it's going to be. I, I'm 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 a skeptical too. Really, I'm, I'm a really hardcore Bitcoiner, but I, I think that is only for the individual. And if you have a, a groupation of hardcore Bitcoiners, this 13% in each country is m more than good. Like, you don't, like, Bitcoin doesn't need to be the dominant network we use to exchange value. It just has to be there, and it is there, and it, I think that it will be there for more years. And that's where I see that it is problematic that people don't care about privacy. Because at the end, if we keep using Bitcoin as we are doing right now, we are opening the door to be captured 
So <laughs> I don't know if we can can have the hyper Bitcoinization with this happening at the same time, but let's see. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. So if we are ready to go, let's go to the lucha libre. <laughs> Híjole, cabrones. Gracias.